So it's my great pleasure to have the second of the two coveted Saturday morning presentations. <laughs> I was going to start with a, a joke about how much butt my presentation is going to kick, but I think Greg's going to be a hard act to follow, so <laughs> let's just do this. So uh, my advisor, my scientific advisor is Alexander Hoffman at UCSD, and uh, true to C CSGF form, I have uh, a couple of co-advisors that I'd like to acknowledge, Pavel Pevsner and Charles Elkin in computer science, and then Glenn Tesler in uh, mathematics. So <laughs> I thought I'd start pretty easy myself. So uh, as you all know, cells respond to perturbation. Otherwise, things like aspirin would not work. And what's becoming increasingly appreciated in my field is that uh, cells, usually if you have a bunch of cells, it's an inherently heterogeneous population. The heterogeneity can either be caused by genetics or epigenetics or just randomness in cell division. And as a result of this, when you perturb a, a population of cells, you get a heterogeneity in the response. And that's not particularly bad, but if you're trying to treat, a, say, a heterogeneous population of cancer cells, then you really don't want this heterogeneity in your response because invariably what happens is you get this phenomenon called fractional killing, which is to say even if this drug, which is called TRAIL, is 99.9% .9 effective, if you're trying to treat, uh, say, a, a million cells or a billion cell population, uh, you're still going to have a million cells left over, which then can repopulate the tumor. And that's usually what leads to uh, uh, your... That's usually what causes tumor to come back the second time after you treat them the first time. <clears throat> so my grand scheme then is to try to take measurements of these, of these cell populations and infer the optimal combination of therapies that could be used to, not, to target more of and hopefully get a better efficiency in the, in the killing. Uh, that's all grand scheme stuff. I'm gonna just do a proof of concept. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a drug called TRAIL, stands for Tumor Necrosis Factor Related Apoptosis Inducing Ligand. So I think biology is second only to the military in, in our acronyms. <laughs> so that's a pretty good one. And the way this guy works, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. It, has a, it activates a molecule called caspase, which essentially breaks down the cellular components. Uh, this loop here is not enough. So, okay, so there's an initiator caspase that gets activated by the, by the ligand, and this activates an effector caspase, which then goes ahead and breaks down the cell. But <clears throat> this loop in and of itself is not enough <coughs> Excuse me, to cause cell death. You also need this feed forward loop that goes into the mitochondria. It causes pores to form on the mitochondria. You get this content spilling out into the cytoplasm. And then when these two loops converge with sufficient dynamics, then you have enough effector caspase activation to kill the cell. Now, there's quite a few trail analogs that are in clinical trials right now. This is as of 2008. I think they're up to phase three now for some of the more successful uh, trail analogs. So there's uh, obviously a drug with a mechanism that's very important. But like any other drug, there's this kind of heterogeneous, heterogeneous response. So this is, uh, this is a trail analog, and this is just the dose on the log scale, and this is how many cells are viable after some amount of time. And these are different primary human cancer cell lines. So some of these guys are very sensitive to this drug, and then some just aren't. So they, again, this reinforces the need to be able to predict the response based on measurements from a particular cell population. So more formally, we kind of want to build a classifier to predict whether or not a cell, will, a cell population will respond, given hopefully as few measurements as possible. Uh, there's some design constraints to this problem. Yeah, we want to use, again, as, as few features as possible. <clears throat> the motivation for this is that these clinical samples are very rare, uh, so you can't just go doing as many measurements as you like, plus these measurements are hard to do. So this has to be very efficient in terms of the number of, div number of dimensions. So here's the blown up version of the trail mechanism. I won't go through it in any detail. It's just to say that these uh, reaction mechanisms tend to be pretty complex, like you saw in Danilo's talk yesterday. But it's basically a, it's some 70 or so reactions and 100 parameters that affect this, the same sort of diagram where you have this uh, caspase activation loop and this feed forward mitochondrial loop. And when you, ha when you have a mechanism of this detail, uh, the sort of standard form in our field is to do this mass action modeling. So the next four slides, I apologize, are going to be a little bit tedious, but uh, since it's where I spent 80% of my graduate work, I feel I should at least put them up here. So for mass action modeling, what you have is a set of species and a set of reactions. The reactions uh, map some subset of those species to some other subset at some rate, k. And then by mass action, you usually assume that the velocity of that reaction, or how much throughput is happening, is proportional to the product of the species, raised to some power, and then with this proportionality constant out there. And then what happens is you say that the, the total, the first derivative of a species with respect to time is going to be equal to essentially the number of reactions that are forming the species minus the number of reactions that are taking it away. Uh, and so you can express that very nicely with this succinct matrix. 
multiplication, where these, this velocity vector is the reaction velocities, uh, and those are nonlinear with respect to the species. <clears throat> so my first couple years then were, uh, I hate to summarize a couple years on the slide, but my, the first thing we want to do is how, how are we going to model heterogeneity, because it's not a, a well-solved problem. <coughs> Typically, when you have these nonlinear systems, um, you have mass action models, which is you, what you do is you specify all the rate constants, and you just let it run. And then wherever that model equilibrates, that's your steady state. And then you go ahead and perturb it and see what happens. But that's not satisfactory. We actually want to specify a priori the steady state. And so what we decided that you can do, uh, I don't want to describe it in too much detail because it's so simple, I feel embarrassed. But actually, what you can do is you can just lump all these parameters, your rate constants and your species, and then you find a linear system within that lumping such that you can solve it very easily. So that's all that's happening here. You define a mapping from your rate constants to your species to parameters p and variables y, such that you have a linear system. And now the steady state is just going to be the null space of this matrix that you just created. So it turns out to be, there's a bit of devils in the de devil in the details, but that's, it, otherwise it's pretty straightforward. And then you can solve for your variable vector by just taking some linear combination of that null space of the coefficient matrix. And then you can map back to your steady state species and rate constants. Uh, so I meant to make more of an issue at, uh, of it at the start, but when I talk about heterogeneity, there's really two classes of heterogeneity. There's what I call static heterogeneity, which is um, differences in the steady state abundances of the species, but there's also something called kinetic heterogeneity, heterogeneity, which is to say you could have the same amount of species, but in one system it could be being turned over very slowly, and in another system it could be turned over very quickly. And uh, this makes a difference in how these cells respond. So to model kinetic heterogeneity, what I was looking for is changes in parameters that don't affect uh, the, change in, so the change in species is zero. So change in parameters where the change in the species concentration is zero. And if you just Taylor expand this and truncate, you have this term here, which essentially you want this di to be zero. So again, this is just, this is the Jacobian of the, of the species with respect to the parameters. And so again, this is just the null space of the Jacobian identifies what's called the isostatic space. So any perturbation vector that's in this space will not affect the, the steady state species. That's cool. So the payoff from this is that now that we can use distributed model parameters rather than discrete model parameters. So here we have uh, these blue guys are species concentrations. A lot of these are measured. In fact, they, they have known gamma distributions with particular um, means and spreads. So we can take these distributions and these kinetic, uh, distributed kinetic parameters and just stick these into the model and just sample as fast as we can. Uh, I, I got into this GPU computing thanks to thanks to Cyrus, actually, and it's a nice little speed up, although we have delays in our equations, so it's a little tricky to put them on these graphics cards. But uh, the idea is you just want to sample these, the steady state as much as possible. And here's just, uh, I don't know, this is just, the response to trail is binary, either, either you die or you don't. So this is a simulation sample number on this axis, and then a particular marker that we use for cell death on this axis, and we, it's a pretty separable population from the cells that respond and do not respond to trail. So at the end of the day, you have this data set. Uh, it looks like this, where you have each row here is a sample number, and then you have a particular set of species abundances in this particular set of kinetic, uh, kinetic rate constants. And you have the response variable, which is either 0 or 1, 0 for it did not die, 1 for it did. And then I think when you get it in this form, I think you can start going to town. So what we want to do is identify the features in here that are most predictive of the response. <coughs> And so for this, we used a procedure called Quadratic Programming Feature Selection, QPFS. And essentially, in a nutshell, what this does is it maximizes the, it finds features with the maximum relevance uh, or maximum correlation with the response, but minimal redundancy between features. So this is how you minimize the number of features that you pull out. <clears throat> Specifically, you have this feature relevance vector, which is just a weighted sum of the correlations between the feature and the response. And then you have this redundancy matrix, which is the pairwise correlation between features. And then if you, to minimize the redundancy and maximize the relevance, you can set that up as a nice quadratic programming problem. So here's this uh, redundancy matrix, here's the feature relevance vector, and then this X is the weighting that you're trying to, that you're trying to minimize. Uh, this is often singular, so you, there's no efficient solution to this unless you do this uh, approximation of this matrix by its principal eigenvalues. So a couple pretty pictures. <clears throat> Here's the output from our, our trail sampling of the trail model. And 
so these are just the parameters. Again, the reds are uh, kinetic parameters, blue are static parameters. And a few things to point out is that no one parameter correlates particularly well with the response. Maybe you get up to 0.35. And uh, the other thing to note is that the kinetic parameters tend to be better features than the, than the static parameters. Uh, the feature redundancy matrix looks something like this. Blue areas are highly or entirely redundant features, and white is unredundant features, yellow is in between. And then this just shows that, so here's a big block, and all these features here are, are mitochondrial features. So this, this says if you, if you measure a particular species in the mitochondria, it doesn't help to measure another species in the mitochondria. They're all so linked up that those are completely redundant features. And here's the result after minimizing that quadratic program. What you see is a lot of features that drop out because they're highly redundant. And you're left with essentially either four or seven good features that you can then use to build a, a classifier. Uh, again, it's interesting that the kinetic features tend to be a lot more informative than the static features. This has kind of clinical implications because uh, a lot of diagnostics right now are obviously based on measuring steady state abundances uh, and not based on measuring kinetics, uh, which is the case because measuring kinetic parameters tends to be very difficult, but this sort of suggests that, you, that those are going to be the more informative features. Uh, and just to throw this up on the map, it's not surprising where the, these are the six interesting kinetic features, and they're all control points for this caspase activation, which is where that branch happened in the, between the feed forward loop and the, and the caspase activation. So it's not surprising where they are in the network. Uh, and then, well, last step, we just take these four or seven most informative features, and we're going to build a logistic regression model, uh, specifically the log odds ratio of a cell dying, probability of a cell dying given either the four or seven feature values. Uh, then we do maximum likelihood estimates of the regression coefficients. That's all standard fare for MATLAB. And then this is just my fancy way of plotting and basically an ROC curve. So red cells or red bars are predicted to die or respond to trail. Blue is predicted not to respond. The darkly shaded areas are correct predictions, lightly shaded as incorrect predictions. And what you see is even with the four feature model, you can get up to 77% accuracy. So we took these 120 or so parameters and reduced it to a four feature model, a four parameter model that had about 80% the accuracy of the full model. And then there's the results for the seven features. It's not really much better. So really four is uh, all you need in this case. Uh, just to conclude, <coughs> I don't encourage that you read this, really. I think my main conclusion is, uh, so one of the themes from this conference I found was the, this issue of dimensions and how do, you, how do you reduce dimensions from a large data set. And um, given the data, there's obviously lots of creative things you can do mathematically to get rid of dimensions that are unnecessary. Uh, but if you don't have the data, then you have to come up with other means. And what I think this is is a nice illustration of using um, bottom-up hypothesis of the mechanism of these uh, drug actions to eliminate features that, just by what you know of the mechanism, are not going to be interesting. Uh, so with that, I thank you, and i especially like to thank, obviously, DOE and all the Krell staff. Uh, it's been a fun ride, and uh, take questions. Thanks. <clears throat>